Welcome to Deals on Wheels, the show that gives everyone with more dash than cash a few tips on how to buy the perfect second-hand car. So sit back and enjoy the next half hour as we get to the bottom of all you need to know. Morning, Rich, mate. What we got on the show tonight? Coming up, remember that Citroen H van we bought in France last week? Well, that's got to be tarted up and sold on. Find out later how you could be the lucky owner. I get behind the wheel of America's baddest hot rod and Mark Rossi needs to find a new home for his Allegro Vanden Plas. They say that bad luck comes in freeze. Well, Gordon's here to prove otherwise. He can't make up his mind which one of his free motors he wants to sell because he likes all of them. So he's going to play a game of car Russian roulette and advertise them all at the same time, knowing full well that one of them's going to get it in the end. Gordon's got a 2CV, that favourite French runaround with more nostalgic appeal than a Sasha Distel CD. The car that shifted the wardrobes of the nation during the 70s, the full Cortina estate. And the entry-level sports car Jag, the XJS 3.6. But which one will be the punter's favourite? Let's find out. Hi there, I'm Gordon Thompson. I live in beautiful Hampshire. And inevitably, I need a car, because if you live in the country, you need a car. So, I bought the Citroën de Chevaux. When I bought this, I missed the kind of certain amount of power. So, to balance it, I bought this one, a Jaguar XJS 3.6 manual. Big, powerful, fun to drive, perfectly balances the de Chevaux. Then I thought, why have I got two cars? I only need one. So then, I snap up this one. 1975 Ford Cortina Mark III Estate. The interesting thing about this car is that for the last 17 years it's been locked away in a garage. It is a little piece of history, it should be in a museum. Now as you can see where I live, I haven't got a garage, so I leave my cars outside, which if I'm going to keep this car isn't fair, because it'll just rot away. So, I'm now in a situation where all my cars are for sale. It's crazy. the car about, I think it's about 18 months. Uh, bought it locally from a little old man who lived up the next village. I snapped it up for 850 quid, which, as far as I'm concerned, was a bargain. Now, what is it, 18 months later, I've got it up for sale at 1500. This is a hill. You don't notice them in normal cars, but in this you do. Second gear, flat out, go on, go. The thing I like about this is it's it's got character, it's got history, and it's a kind of an icon in British motoring. And I was lucky enough to find it just by idly glancing through the small ads in loot. When I spotted it, I thought it was a printing error. So I rang up the lady. She said, for the last 17 years, it had been sitting in her garage, untouched. It was advertised, 1,300 quid, and I just was straight up there immediately. This uh, Jaguar XJS. 3.6 manual. It's what I call long-legged, which means, in a contrast to the De Chevaux, which is kind of short-legged and whizzy and gets you from one little village to another little village, this one gets you from like one country to another country. If they do go, inevitably the question arises, what do I replace them with? Presumably it's one car, possibly a Series 3 Land Rover, something with a bit of character, but certainly it ain't going to be a modern car. So, finally, in conclusion, three cars for sale. Beginning with the Citroen 2CV, asking 1,500 quid. Second car, Ford Cortina, asking 3,000, perhaps looking for two and a half, who knows. Finally, third car, Jaguar XJS, asking 2,950, perhaps looking for 2,750. As to which one will go first, I think it'll be the Citroen de Chevaux. Sunday morning, I've just had a phone call from a chap who wants to come and look at the Jaguar. He did say he wants to have a look at this one and then go on and have a look at another one. But I'm rather hoping when he sees it, he'll just think, yeah, great. Now, one of the most common problems on a pre-91 XJS are the rear brakes because they're tucked away right down behind the rear axle, they're fiddly to get to, and they often get neglected. So ask the owner if he's had any previous work done because parts alone are 600 quid and they take all day to fit. Now, we're big fans of the XJS on Deals on Wheels, but if you can afford it, go for a post-91 model because by then, they received their long overdue galvanised body and rust problems won't creep in like this around the rear wheel arch. 
The engines and drivetrains fitted to most Jaguars are generally very reliable. In fact, the V12 engine fitted to most XJSs is nigh on indestructible, and even the later six-cylinder cars aren't bad either. Now remember, these cars were pretty expensive when they were new. We're talking £49,200 in 1994. And it was generally assumed that if you could afford to buy one, you could also afford to run it. So we're talking heavy repair bills, refinement costs money. £400 just to fix the troublesome air conditioning unit. There's something about looking down the long sculpted bonnet of an XJS that makes them very popular. But cheap ones have huge garage bills lurking around the corner and I wouldn't pay more than £2,350 for that one. Now Gordon's asking £2,950, which isn't a lot for a lot of motor, but me, I always want to get stuff a little bit cheaper. So I'd only give £2,500. quid. let us see what happens. You found it all right? Yeah. Right, the car's up the top. Right. Deregistered manual, yeah. 3.6 in line, six cylinder. Was that genuine mileage? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, was it, 64,800, I think. Mines look good as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's stacks of room in there. Yeah, there is, there. isn't there? What does oh. the tank hold? Oh, lots. Sure. Can't lots. remember now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll certainly let you know yeah, we're uh, this here. afternoon. Oh, great. Oh. Really good. You give us time to get to Reading and back. Just had a phone call from these people who came around and had a look at the Jaguar. And uh, they've gone away, seen the other one, and they, they want to come back and have a look at mine. And I'm rather hoping that they've decided that mine's the better one of the two. It drives lovely, doesn't it? Oh, I think it's amazing. And this is where you should feel a bit of power. It's warmed up. Oh, there's loads there, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. Right, lovely. Yeah, it's very well. Yeah, yeah. yeah very well. Right, it's just a price now then. Right. So, uh, what you want it then? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'll <laughs> we'll have it. Yes, I will have it. Would you take two seven fifty? Uh, meet you halfway on two eight fifty. Right. Yeah. Right. Done. <laughs> Deal. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Just get the. Get the dash. Get some dash. Marvelous. I could have gone to the airport with this today. <laughs> Yeah. Okay then, somewhere right. in there. Oh, there's a great deal there. You'll get no more. That's it, best of luck right. then. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Great. It's always nice if we go to somebody who's never had a Jaguar before. One down, two to go. I'll tell you, if somebody comes back from a test drive and they badly want that car, you can afford to play hardball a little. That's right, Mike. Now, last week we went off to France and bought ourselves an H-van and a load of filthy old cheese. Well, this week we've got to get shot of the cheese and get the H-van ready for the UK roads. So hang on to your berries, everybody, because someone's going to be the lucky new owner of this gorgeous French whippersnapper. Remember, last week Mike was far from convinced about the charms of the H-Fan, so I gave him the keys to prove that the old girl wasn't as bad as he was making out. I'm finding quite endearing about this car. One of them is really its honesty. It does exactly what it says on a tin. It's not fancy. And this is the beauty of H-Fans, because everything is accessible. But look at this. You know, drive your here. And you can just... There you are. Oh, hey! There is the engine. Oh, I'd rather the engine. you put the cover you back. Can even Change the plugs while you're as you're, as you as you're on the move. No problem. Please mate. put the cover back. Oh, blimey. Yeah, you see? Not only a Simply. blast of heat and carbon oxide, but that is horrible. Marvellous. Even though my little H-Van had managed to worm its way into Mike's affections, it was time we all parted company. Mike went to Spitalfields Market in London to get rid of his cheese, and I headed off to the garage to get the Citroen fit for our roads. Now, the H-Fan makes an ideal starter restoration project even for those with limited mechanical knowledge because they're so cheap and simple to work on. So where do I start? Well, with the essentials, like the headlights, for example. Now, if the bulbs are orange, that doesn't matter, but the beam needs to shine to the left-hand side of the road rather than to the right. The main thing is to get an MOT on this thing before we start worrying about the fancy stuff. You can't get that in Sainsbury's, can you get the two pound of it? It's impossible. And it is fresh from Normandy. Despite what Mike says, this isn't in bad nick for a 20-year-old van. Sure, this door needs replacing here, but we got one of those thrown in with a deal. The exhaust silencer's got a hole in it, but that's easy enough to replace, and a second-hand one only costs £25. 
And we need to replace the tyres, front ones of course, being front wheel drive. But at only £100 a pair for second hand ones, it's hardly going to break the bank. Three pound a piece of brie, right for the eating. Some pot levy, can and bear going cheap. It also needs some tinkering to the engine before we replace some of the brake pipes. And then after that, we're going to rust proof the whole underside of the vehicle so that this old girl is ready for another 20 years hard labour. And if all this seems too much like hard work, then just consider the facts. Our H-Van brought Mike and his cheese all the way back from France. In fact, an H-Van will carry more than its own weight. And depending how much energy you have, it could start a whole new career for you, or at least pay for its upkeep. And talking of upkeep, I wonder how our boy is getting on selling his cheese. Okay, Maestro, I sell my cheese and for a profit. And I see you're still stuck with this smelly old French van. That's okay, matey, because I have the perfect solution. We're going to auction off this wonderful French beauty on the internet website. Now, you know that I paid £1,900 for this van, and since then, I put more than my fair share of elbow grease into it. So we're going to start the bidding at, say, £200, and whoever gives us the highest bid by this time next week gets to take this wonderful French classic home with them. So good luck, everybody. That's right, you heard the man, 200 quid. So get onto our website at www.4car.co.uk and start bidding. Next up, bring Ming Dynasty Vaz, reserve price 1.5. We'll start the bidding at 1.3, thank you, sir. 1.6, back to the lady, we have 1.7. No one else, going once, going twice. <laughs> <laughs> Citra offers so good you'll be laughing. Saxo from 6995, Zara from 9995, and Xantia from 12995. Slow down, a little less gas. Watch your bend. Enemies now are Bravo. Get Drop off Charlie. Go right! Kill the legs. Get through the trees, go left. This is the last banner I ever do. With a guaranteed jackpot of fifteen million pounds, this Wednesday super draw is too big to miss. New Walker's Red Hot Max. Be careful. They're as hot as hell. He's behind me, isn't he? New Walker's Red Hot Max. NatWest helped 67,000 people break away and set up their own business. I was three-time champion in this country. Don't forget our auction for the Citroen H-Van at www.4car.co.uk or if you fancy something American, check out our comprehensive buyer's guide. 
Creating upmarket luxurious versions of small cars is a great idea in principle. So, take the name and reputation of one of Britain's greatest coach builders, Van den Plas, and marry it with something small and perfectly formed. Well, that's what British Leyland thought they'd do in 1974. The only problem was that the car they chose to give the Van den Plas treatment to was the dreadful Austin Allegro. Inside, it's pretty convincing, with its leather upholstery, walnut dashboard, mohair roof lining, and even picnic tables in the back, there's more than a hint of Rolls-Royce or Bentley about it. One fan is Mark Rossi, who actually has two of these things, so not surprisingly, one of them has to find a new home. I'm Mark Rossi, and this is my kid sister, Angela. Hello, and you can see the problem, we've got three cars and we don't really need three cars. This is the, the car I had originally, I've had this for about three years. It's 30 years old, it's a Vandom Plaid. So I won't use this when it rains or in the winter. So to effectively get a second car, I thought not such a prime example, which is the successor, the All Agro. Now it's come to the crunch, I've got to get rid of one of them. I can't actually bear to part with my better one, so now I have to except that I've made a mistake in buying this about three months ago, and I'm going to have to sell this. I'll tell you what, brother, it's a nice day for a car drive. Whee! When we get to here, because this is the private estate, we go, this is the bad land. Bad land. It's because, you know, it's the real world. Well, I'm selling the car for £600, which is slightly below the market price that so that I won't have to do much wrangling with the buyer. I have uh, no worries about selling it because I don't need the money, it doesn't stop me doing anything. So really, uh, when it goes, it goes. Well, it is a wonderful car as you can see. £600 isn't a lot of money. Someone's going to get a wonderful bargain. It may only be an Allegro on the outside, but on the inside it's a very rare Vanden Plas. And that means you should check the interior carefully for signs of damage. For that luxury feel, they used an awful lot of walnut trim. They used real Wilton carpets, and they used a part leather interior. Now, to refinish all this walnut is going to cost you at least £400. To change those carpets will cost £350. And for a full leather retrim, well, that could cost you a grand. And that's more than most of these cars are worth. So, far better to go for a car with a good interior than to go for one that the poodles run riot in. With spare parts available from British Leyland and almost every body panel being the same as the Austin Allegro, only one of these may not be as daft as you think. But under the bonnet, listen out for any bad noises coming from the timing chain. If it snaps, you have to separate the engine from the gearbox and it's a big job and very expensive. Also, be wary of automatics. If the gear selector cable goes, you'll have a great deal of trouble finding a replacement one. In fact, they're as rare as the 30 bob note. All the leather and wood in the world can't disguise the fact that this is basically an old Austin Allegro, and I reckon Mark would be lucky to get 450 quid for it. Yeah, despite the gentleman's club atmosphere, even a pucker one of these isn't going to be worth more than 1,500 quid. Mark's, yours is a bit of a nail, mate. I reckon it's worth 500 pounds. Let's see what happens. I've just had an excited call from a young man who's uh, rather pleased that the car's still for sale. We've had no word uh, as of yet, but he's only six minutes late at the, the minute, so um, I confidently expect he will be here. Ah, OK. Right. Right. So I'm a bit late. But... That's OK, no worries. Here is the beast. Start it up for us. OK, yeah. yeah. Do you want to uh, go and have a little test drive? Yeah. Oh, careful for the humps. There are yeah. humps just about everywhere here. Is there, is there much humping going on where you are? Very nifty with the old uh, gear change. I like that. Very good. <laughs> Remember, Mark's looking for six hundred pounds. Let's see what he can do. Let's come inside. That's gone very well. Gary is a very good driver. His father was an instructor, and you could see the way he drove it. He was very good. He likes the car. Um, I'd like him to have it. Um, I, th I think that um, acting 
for the Van den Plaats Club in general that they would approve of his uh, stewardship of the car, and I think I can permit him to allow his name to go forward to buy it. Right, I'm back with the uh, aforementioned documents. Wonderful reading, isn't it? Yeah. I'll quickly drink my coffee. Okay, you can have another quick look. Then. Okay, no, no, they need to have a quick look. Have a, have a good long look. Nice carpets, aren't they? No. Are you open to an offer? Then? Yeah. No, I want six hundred. It's it's underpriced as it is. Yeah. But I thought I'd do that so as to avoid all the wrangling and so forth. Want to shake me then? Well, I'm only really looking to spend about five hundred. I think it's worth six hundred. You're not going to get better than that, are you? Uh, I'll have to have a think about it. Okay, then, really, that's I, okay, I don't mind. I'm on a sort of a tight budget, so... I understand. Phoned Mark the day after viewing the car, after thinking about it, um, and did raise my offer to £550. Um, and then there was a slight hitch, as I thought that included the tax. Yes, I hadn't made clear at all that the tax disc wasn't included. And so Gary improved the offer to £600, and so we did a hand clasp over the miles down the phone. And so Gary has come here this evening to consummate the act. Oh, loads of money. It's, it's the pub for me this evening. Oh, anyway, I've never seen so much in any one go. Bye bye, Brownie. Bye bye. Nice deal, and two happy customers, even if it did take them a while to sort out the rules of engagement. A word of advice, if you're going to sell your car, tell them exactly what's included in the price. Otherwise, you'll end up squabbling over something as trivial as a personalised number plate. Now then, Rich, I know you like these big gas-guzzling cars. What's this one all about, then? It's an American icon, Mike, and one that will embarrass many a European supercar. Take a look at this. The Pontiac Firebird. How can such a great car have such an appalling image? In England, an old Cavalier with a body kit has more credibility. Make no mistake, drive a Firebird and you will be laughed at. But only by those who know nothing about cars. Seven litres of V8, producing 345 horsepower. That's 0 to 60 in 5.7 seconds, which is faster than the fastest Aston Martin at the time. And the fastest Lamborghini, the fastest Jaguar, Porsche and Maserati. In fact, only one Ferrari could beat it, and that was the top of the range Daytona. And you could buy a whole load of new Trans Ams for the price of one of those and have enough left over for a new clean gold medallion for every day of the week. The only thing that gives the ferocious performance of the car away is the amazing shaker hood scoop on the bonnet. It pokes through a hole in the hood so that when you gun the throttle, it sucks air from the low pressure area at the bottom of the windscreen directly into the carburetor. Sure, it's a gimmick, but it's a gimmick that works, and it comes straight from the world of dragsters, which is, of course, exactly what this car is. A dragster, a missile designed to go as quickly as possible in a straight line, with little or no regard for handling and cornering. In fact, the challenge with Trans Am is just keeping it on the road. How you do that is entirely secondary. While it's true that every Trans Am after 1974 was a kind of phallic symbol for the open shirt flare jeans fraternity, the early cars like this one, built between 1970 and 1973, are true classics. And how many mass-produced European cars of the time took aerodynamics seriously? The side profile with its frameless windows, concealed windscreen wipers and ducktail spoiler might look familiar today, but the Trans Am was the first mass-produced car to have them. 
So what's the downside? Well, aside from the horrifying fuel consumption, we're talking 12 to 14 to the gallon, there really isn't much. They're very well made, they're mechanically indestructible, and they don't even rust very much. Although you should remember that these are 30 years old, and that means you should check for rot in all the usual places, and especially around these window trims and along this rear flitch plate. Being a racier version of a standard car, it's very important you get one that's really original. Now this desirable engine may have been swapped with a later, cheaper unit, and to make sure it hasn't been, you want to make sure the chassis number, which is stamped over here, matches the engine number, which is in the block down there. Now a Pontiac book, which you can get from one of the specialist bookshops, will give you the codes you need. It's also important to make sure the colour's original. Now, early proper Trans Ams were almost always white with a blue stripe, and just occasionally blue with a white stripe. And make sure, too, that the original Rally 2 steel wheels are on the car, because many will have been replaced with later alloys, and they're wrong. Check the interior for originality, too. The seats, the steering wheel, dashboard, the radio, all these items could have been replaced with equivalents from much later and less desirable models. The 1973 455SD Trans Am was the fastest coupe in America for 20 years. Now, a mint one of those will cost two or three times the price of this, the marginally slower, earlier version. Now, the good news is that a really good one of these is only going to cost you £8,000. And you can get a perfectly usable one for as little as six. And for that kind of money, you really needn't feel embarrassed about owning one. Just take it out at night when your mates and the kids are in bed. That way, no one need ever know you've got one. Over seven litres of engine, Richard. That's obscene. That's bigger than a boiler in my house. Well, sometimes, Mike, you just have to think big in life. Well, that's it from Mike and I for this week. We'll see you next time for more wheeling and dealing. Now, Mike, your cheese ruined my van. My cheese ruined your van. Your van ruined my cheese. My cheese was fresh. What are you talking about? Come cheese back... ruined a van. Because it was fresh, and then it came back rotten. On the trip coming back from France. I thought you didn't call it. Well, it was, Richard. It was rotten. Come on.